to our uh, second event for Adam Smithley, second major event, I should say, our second speaker. Uh, this is part of what we refer to as our Philosophy and Political Economy series. Uh, for those of you who did not know me, I'm Professor Peter Calcano, Professor of Economics here at College of Boston, and I'm the director of the initiative called the Choice of Market Process. This is our fifth annual Adam Smithley. Excited to uh, have our speaker today, David Schmitz. Uh, before we get started today, just a couple of things of housekeeping. You should have all gotten a attendance card and questionnaire. Um, I ask that you please fill the attendance card down. It helps us just to get a count and so forth. Also, we'll provide those back to professors if you've been given any added incentives to attend the lecture. Um, and if you'll drop those along with the questionnaires, those provide us feedback on the speaker, which we greatly appreciate. There's a box on the table on your way out. In addition, there is um, uh, schedules for the rest of the week uh, so you can find out about the other speakers and so forth. To uh, tomorrow night, we have Nick French uh, from, uh, uh, who's going to be talking on real estate and valuation. So uh, it'll be 7 o'clock in the evening in this room. I encourage you to come out for that as well. Uh, right now, I want to uh, turn the podium over to Professor Jennifer Baker of Philosophy, who will provide our introduction for our, our guest speaker today. Thank you, Pete. Thank you all for coming. Dave Schmitz is the Kendrick Professor of Philosophy and Joint Professor of Economics at the University of Arizona. Philosophers mainly write articles, and he's the author of literally dozens of articles, and they range over a wide array of topics, and they're really good, too. Um, so I have no idea how he does it, but some of his articles have been collected in the um, anthology of his work, Person, Polis, and Planet. Um, his articles have been translated into all sorts of languages. It's very impressive, I think, such a compliment. Um, his other books include the highly anticipated and then really well-received Elements of Justice. He's also written Rational Choice and Moral Agency, Social Welfare and Individual Responsibility, a volume on Robert Nozick, in the anthology I'm using in uh, my course, Environmental Ethics, called Environmental Ethics, What Really Matters, What Really Works. Our students read Schmitz in political philosophy courses, environmental ethics courses, and ethics courses here. So that's a range. He grew up in Canada and earned his PhD at the University of Arizona working under Joel Feinberg. I was lucky enough to have him as my advisor. And in fact, um, he's the into philosophy in the first place. It was a talk simple but accurate term, and he used the term myutic when he was referring to myutic as kind of the goal of having other goals. And that was pretty much what did me in, and I was being interested in philosophy for life, and I hope that happens to all of you today. And thank you all for coming today. Can you hear me all right? OK, thanks. So Adam Smith, uh, how many people think of Adam Smith as an economist? How many? Yeah, sure. How many people think of Adam Smith as a philosopher? Yeah, he, well, OK, an economist, yeah. <clears throat> you know, economists think of him as a philosopher. Philosophers think of him as an economist. So as famous as he is, he's actually uh, uh, kind of fallen through the cracks a bit. Uh, he's one of the best uh, philosophers who ever lived, though, uh, and one of the things that he did, uh, in effect, led to the inventing of economics as an academic discipline. So he gave us uh, elements of a theory about what sort of freedom society makes possible and what sort of challenge this freedom represents and how and why freedom is achieved in particular cases. And I'm going to discuss four elements of that picture today. Uh, four main arguments that you find. One is that markets free people from literal starvation, prevalent before the emergence of markets, uh, increasingly rare after. Uh, markets free us from servility, from relationships of servitude or slavery, but markets are not a guarantee. They can be corrupted. Markets can be corrupted by crony capitalism, by merchants and kings buying and selling political privilege. And they can be corrupted by 
in effect, how much we want. And you might think the obvious problem here is that markets get corrupted and they get out of control or something like that when we want too much. And actually, the problem that Smith is more concerned is, in a curious way, how markets get corrupted by our wanting too little. So Ryan Hanley says that the uh, fundamental uh, departure for Smith's, Adam, uh, Ryan Hanley is one of their half a dozen uh, top experts in Adam Smith today. Uh, uh, me, not one of them, uh, but uh, I'm sort of second tier, but there are half a dozen or so who are really top notch. Uh, Ryan Hanley says that the fundamental departure for Smith's defense of commercial society is its capacity to provide for the poor. So to Smith, in Smith's words, no society can be happy, can be flourishing, uh, of which the far greater part of its members are poor and miserable. And Smith saw commercial society as liberating people in general from desperate need. So in a village, a poor man's son, that's one of Smith's phrases, a poor man's son might grow up to become a doctor, but it's certain that no one will be pushing the frontiers of oral surgery because in a village there are too few customers to sustain a specialized trade, any specialized trade. To see specialized trade, you have to go to a commercial hub like London where someone <coughs> who otherwise might have been a village carpenter can specialize in making violins. Right? So imagine if you're in the village, if you're the village carpenter, how often do you get an order for a violin? Like maybe once a century? Basically never. Uh, so you're not going to get viol violin makers in the village unless they're serving a mail order or something like that. They've got to be plugged into a big community. And that's important. As Smith understood, economies of scale create the very possibility of fine-grained specialization and thereby create new dimensions of possible dimensions of pride in being able to perform superlatively at a given line of work. So in port cities, the arts proliferate and people innovate because port cities are hubs of commerce. They're where cultures meet and where entrepreneurs come looking for ideas. So if you want to find people publishing the uh, you know, cutting edge critiques of capitalism, you're not going to find that in Moscow or, or uh, Beijing. You're going to find that in a place like New York or London. So that's, that's where the action is going to be. How would we ensure that when London needs more carpenters, that more people go into carpentry? Smith's answer is one of his signature insights. Given price signals, we check to see whether there's a problem and actually in the process acquire our reason to help solve the problem by checking the price of a carpenter's wage. This simple, elegant mechanism, intuitively grasped by everyone who buys and sells, coordinates productive efforts of people who may share neither a religion nor even a language and might only be dimly aware of each other's existence. A spike in the wages of carpentry more reliably than anything else alerts customers to a need to be more economical in their use of carpentry services, simultaneously alerting prospective producers that uh, uh, that there is a rising need for carpentry services. Falling prices are a form of creative destruction. More reliably than anything else, falling prices signal would-be suppliers that a community already has more than it needs. Right? And that they should look for a more productive form in which to bring their services to market. So from such economic coordination made possible by free-floating price signals, the wealth of nations is made. And what gets classified as poverty will be what previous generations would have called opulence, such that even the poorest members of market societies will have, you know, if you can imagine how imaginative a person Adam Smith was, you could imagine someday uh, that uh, life expectancies will exceed 50 years. 
Where Plato supposed that the wealth of nations must ultimately depend on a guardian class assigning to each worker tasks appropriate to that worker's nature. And Smith was a student of Plato. Uh, I mean, a scholar, a studier of Plato. Smith realized that no guardian class could ever know enough or reliably care enough to handle such a task. Only a price mechanism can manage this and track this incomprehensibly vast torrent of feedback, daily feedback from buyers and sellers regarding whether X is worth producing and if so, where it needs to be shipped so as to reach customers to whom X is worth what it costs to get it to them. So that's uh, one basic idea. A mechanism that liberates people, especially the poor, from starvation. Pretty much wherever it goes. And second idea I mentioned was freedom from servility. So this second freedom transforming Europe's economy by Smith's time was a freedom of ordinary people to contract with someone other than their lord. So in a feudal system, if you're born a serf, you're entitled to your lord's protection, which is a good thing, but at the same time, you lack many of the rights that today we would take for granted. And these are rights that you need in order to not be starving, basically, and to not be servile. In a feudal system, you live where your lord tells you to live. You grow what your lord tells you to grow. You sell your harvest to the lord, no one else, at a price of your lord's choosing, which just staggers me. I mean, imagine a price not being a bilateral thing. Imagine it being a one-way thing. Imagine going into a store and the person saying, a carton of milk, that's uh, $3, and that'll be $3 right now or I'll have you thrown in jail. Like, imagine that. You would never go into a store. Or imagine going in saying, uh, the price of a uh, uh, quart of milk is 39 cents, hand it over, or you go to jail. I mean, it's feudalism. I mean, amazing. But uh, yeah, it was once a one-way deal. If you want to leave, you ask your Lord's permission. When you meet your Lord, you bow, and your, nor your Lord finds that natural, and so do you. As the market supplanted this system, the effect was liberating for all, but especially, of course, the poor. Your dependence on your Lord's mercy is replaced by an autonomous interdependence in a loose-knit but functional community of customers and suppliers. If you choose to work for an employer instead of launching a business of your own, you delegate to your employer many decisions and you relegate to your employer many of the risks of making those decisions. You remain a free agent in a pivotal sense that when you decide to leave, you don't need permission. <clears throat> so even as an employee, <clears throat> It may not be what you're aspiring to. You may aspire to run your own business, but even as an employee, you are in crucial ways. <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, sinus. Second, people are insufficiently intent on properly running their own lives. 
So one problem corrupts the polis, the city, the other corrupts the soul. And this pair of problems arguably is the driving focus of Smith's two major works. So that first thing, corrupting the city, the community. We labor under this ever-present threat of being shackled by crony capitalists. Smith wondered how internally stable could a free market be in the face of a tendency for its political infrastructure to decay into crony capitalism. Partnerships between big business, this is a person writing in the, in the 1770s, 1760s, 1750s. Partnerships between big business and big government lead to big subsidies. These ways of compromising freedom have been and always will be, he's saying this in the 1770s, always will be touted as protecting the middle class. But their true purpose is and almost always will be to transfer wealth and power from ordinary citizens to well-connected elites. As a result, ordinary citizens' pivotal relationships are not with free and equal trading partners, but with bureaucratic rulers, people whose grip on our community is so pervasive that we can't walk away from such terms as a, of engagement as they unilaterally propose. And thus, we reinvent feudalism. We're at the mercy of lords. Adam Smith fought mercantilism, protectionism, and other forms of crony capitalism because such policies stifle innovation. So Smith has some remarks on the good, the bad, and the uh, ugly of uh, industrial motivation. I, that's a reminder to come up with a concrete example. I didn't do that. But uh, um, actually, this was... Uh, a reminder of, uh, you know what this is? This is a window envelope. This is a, a, a thought about how profit gets made in, uh, uh, in the real world, that uh, somebody invented this idea, and what's it worth? Hardly anything, really. But the thing is, there's a secretary somewhere who's on a manual typewriter typing up an invoice with a person's address on it, a bill, folding the, envelope, folding the invoice, putting it in an envelope, and then typing the address again. And somebody came up with an invention. You put a window in the envelope, you stuff the envelope, you don't need to retype the, end, the uh, uh, address. So you're saving 10 seconds or whatever, 20 seconds of a uh, secretary's time, whatever, uh, 100 million times a day? This is like saving literally lifetimes worth of work uh, is what that little invention did. The amount of profit that a person makes on one of these, selling one unit of that invention, could it be as much as a penny? Probably not, just a penny. But that's how you get to be a billionaire, you could, like Walmart. Walmart doesn't, figure, Walmart doesn't make, make millions by ripping off customers for a million dollars a shot. It makes a few pennies profit on each sale and the customers actually take away almost all of the cooperative surplus produced by that sale. But Walmart does it hundreds of millions of times a day, maybe. And as a result, they, uh, they make profits in the billions. So uh, yeah, that's, that's the way to get really rich. Anyway, where was I? There we are. This is, uh, now Smith is talking about the downside. And he's saying this is who ends up running the country. To widen the market, narrow the competition, always in the interest of the dealers. To widen the market may, infrequently, may frequently be agreeable enough to the interest of the public, but to narrow the competition must always be against it and can serve only to enable the dealers by raising their profits above what they naturally would be to levy for their own benefit an absurd tax upon the rest of their fellow citizens. So Smith goes on from there. But... Uh, Point is, unfortunately, kings wanting to fight wars, re-election campaigns, employing expensive mercenaries, re-election campaigns, uh, are driven to sell monopoly licenses to generate revenue. In effect, restraint of trade to generate revenue. And this market for political power has a singularly unhappy logic. 
And it's worse than it looks because kings then adopt policies systematically favoring merchants who have lost their economic edge. Because inferior competitors are going to be the ones most willing to pay for the imposition of tariffs and other legal barriers to competition. As a friend of Adam Smith's, David Hume, saw the easy transfer of external goods, say through taxation, was both an enormous opportunity and an enormous problem, a foundation of both the promise and the downfall of capitalism. It makes piracy possible and enables crony capitalists to enlist the help of kings to bureaucratize piracy and make it look normal, make it look routine. So as we labor under this, uh, this problem of being uh, shackled by uh, crony capitalists, there's a, that pairs with a, a worry about being uh, shackled by men of system, which is a famous phrase in uh, Smith. So a uh, uh, colleague, a uh, respectable uh, uh, sort of adversary of mine, but anyway, he's another of the very famous interpreters of uh, uh, Adam Smith, a good guy. He says that the limitations Smith describes on what anyone can know about their society should give pause to those who are confident governments can carry out even the task of protecting freedom, freedom successfully, taken together with his skepticism about the judiciousness, decency, and impartiality of those who go into politics. This is what gives punch to the libertarian reading of Smith. And then uh, Sam goes on to say that there's another reading and that Smith was not, uh, and I agree with him on this, Smith was not any uh, card-carrying libertarian. He was... Uh, he had a pretty sophisticated uh, uh, view. And the libertarian part of it was real, but it wasn't the whole story. Anyway, as Smith saw it, that's uh, Fleischacker's reading of Smith, but as Smith saw it, this is a quotation from uh, Theory of Moral Sentiments. This is his moral theory now, not his uh, economics or his political theory. But he's talking about the man of system man who goes into politics, man who goes in with the aim of fixing things, as is apt to be very wise in his own conceit. He seems to imagine that he can arrange the different members of a great society with as much ease as the hand arranges the different pieces on a chessboard. Doesn't consider that the pieces on the board have no other principle of motion besides which the hand impresses upon them. That's on the chessboard, but in the great chessboard of human society, every single piece has a principle of motion all its own. Altogether different from what the legislature might wish to uh, impose on it. So a man of system moves these pawns around. I'm saying pawns in quotation marks. But the pawns tend to respond in an irritatingly contrarian way. A man of system moves the pieces, but the pieces respond as if they have minds of their own, which, after all, they do. People respond with a view to their own hopes and dreams, but also with their own sense, okay, their own sense of what their society is and where it needs to go from here, what the common good is really all about. So in sense, by the pawn's contrarian response, the men of system make adjustments now seeking to dominate pawns more than help them. And any virtue those would-be servants initially brought to public uh, office is pretty much down the toilet. Compounding the problem, even worse than that, the reins of power come at a price, because there's a sorting mechanism here. Anyone acquiring those reins has to be a person to whom acquiring those reins is worth the price. And as the price goes up, that's more and more a different kind of person from you and me. The more power there is to acquire, the more it will be worth. And the more people must invest to acquire it, to acquire it, the elections will become more expensive as the, as the prize becomes bigger. That is inevitable. There are no law that can stop that. And thus, the more power will get concentrated in hands of people intent on using it for all it's worth. Adam Smith, 
1700s. So the process by which people gain political appointment will, be, will systematically tend and increasingly tend to select the wrong person for the job. Consequently, there's a pervasive, systematic, predictable, increasing disconnect between what truly benevolent people seek and what men of system deliver. Such tension is driven by the logic of offices that align bureaucratic interests with that of these dealers that I talked about, in, uh, that Adam Smith talks about, dealers in particular rather than the public in general. As Smith sees it, the law cannot circumvent this logic. But at least it could avoid requiring dealers and uh, bureaucratic men of system alike to be driven uh, uh, by it. Um, so at least you can avoid making, uh, say, free trade illegal. But there is a presumption of liberty allowing ordinary merchants a measure of freedom from regulation by dealers and such men of system as the dealers can buy. So that's a second kind of corruption of the city. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about is the corruption of the person within, uh, that's possible within a market society. Excuse me. So I mentioned two factors that corrupt the polis, dividing a community against itself. One is some capitalists end up being pirates rather than producers. And the second thing is many public servants become men of system, treating people like pawns to be patronized at best, squashed at worst, and who themselves eventually become pawns of crony capitalists. So a person's soul can likewise be divided against itself as, as Plato knew. First, uh, now we're just talking about Adam Smith. Uh, after acquiring enough to meet genuine needs, people tend to keep working. Why? <coughs> well, part of the reason is that they seek to amass enough wealth to make themselves more visible. Right? They want to be stars. So Smith speaks of this poor man's son whose drive for visibility translates into a simplistic desire to win. He who dies with the most toys wins. So the poor man's son is, among other things, an embryonic form of a crony capitalist and the man of system. It's a seed from which these corruptions grow. But even before that, tormented by envy and untutored ambition. This poor man's son's <coughs> quest for opulence comes to revolve around keeping up with the Joneses or keeping the Joneses in line rather than around a meaningful life. This poor man's son loses sight of the difference between creating wealth and merely capturing it. They're up by helping to turn what should have been an effervescent, positive-sum society into a dreary zero-sum game where players spend much of their time waiting in line to beg bureaucrats for permission to make a move. So uh, Jennifer introduced me as a Kendrick professor. Uh, so that's named after uh, a family. Uh, and I was talking to... Uh, Mrs. Kendrick one day, uh, and she, uh, she said, I, I just come from, I go to businessmen's lunches, I go to businessmen's wives' luncheons, and uh, I get, I hear people like bragging about their husband's exploits. And some of them will talk about uh, their husband getting a, a government contract with the help of uh, his brother-in-law who's a city council or something like that, uh, or we'll talk about getting a government grant or something like that. We'll talk about that with just as much pride as someone who has invented a new medication or a new software program that will save, or a new kind of envelope, whatever, that will save millions of hours, literally. She said, they, don't, they can't tell the difference. They're, they're just proud of the money. Where it came from, that's not, that just doesn't register for them as, a, as an issue. And she said, and these are 
this, these are pillars of the business community, and they don't get the difference between producing wealth and just grabbing it. And so she said, is, is this the end of the world or what? So, uh, uh, yeah, we actually did some programmatic things to try to teach people about the ethics as well as the economics of wealth creation. Um, and I owe her a lot. But, uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's a challenge, to be sensitive to that difference. So Smith sees the poor man's son everywhere he looks. Smith is glad that people work as hard as they do for their customers. He notices that people are as productive as they are. He laments, what he laments is that people come to care so little for themselves. It takes maturity and true self-centeredness to transcend this drive and develop the habitual serenity that goes with deeply minding one's own business. Not everyone has what it takes. What makes a society unique, um, what makes market society unique though, is it's not that it makes alienation inevitable, it's that it raises the frontier of human possibility. The fact that we achieve so much less than we could is partly a function of how much more we've been liberated to achieve. It's the ceiling is that much higher than it used to be. So that we're not hitting it is, uh, is even more noticeable, even more lamentable in a way. Market society gives us free time to indulge such laments. Like we're not working 16 hours a day, seven days a week until the sun goes down just to put together enough food to make it through another day. <clears throat> but that's not a bad thing either. And so Smith's discussion of this failure to hit the rising ceiling of our potential was merely a lament, not a damnation. It's a reflection on how much capitalism makes possible, as well as a reflection on how little it guarantees. <clears throat> so a precondition of free society is people accepting that they live in a world thick with both, poth both possibilities and responsibilities and that not all possibilities will be realized. We trust people to do their best. We accept that many of them won't. Using leisure time well is a skill. Developing that skill is an achievement. Both individuals and cultures need to practice, right? to fully capitalize on the potentials of new, new opportunities. <clears throat> so the surpassing complement to commercial society that Smith wants to pay is to say that members of commercial society, even in failing to be all they could be, make life better for their trading partners. Laborers working overtime for trinkets, for cars, they make our world a better place even while squandering opportunities to enjoy their earnings in more thoughtful, creative, self-fulfilling ways. Part of the problem with this feverish quest for happiness via the acquiring of toys and trinkets is that it embodies a real mistake. It confuses the false visibility that comes from conspicuous consumption with the estimable visibility that comes from conspicuous production. To Smith, our concern to be validated by others can drive our maturation through a certain stage, can drive children to grow up. But then we'll need to outgrow that drive. Otherwise, it becomes a psychological shackle. Why? Because to greatly care about external validation is to be controlled by the hoped-for source of that validation. It's good for growing children to feel a need to insinuate themselves into socializing networks and to learn the rudiments of being a good neighbor and a good citizen. But for an adult, the liberating ideal is stoic indifference. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's a, a second families of ways um, for a soul to be divided against itself. I've talked about, you know, wanting too, that's sort of wanting too much, but really wanting too little for yourself. You know, having too little self-respect. But here's another. Specialization is a source of the greatest benefits of human civilization. But Marx would come to share 
Smith's worry that repetitive factory floor work can make a mind drowsy. So people sometimes say things like, uh, Smith was the first of the classical economists and Marx was the last. Uh, so, you know, there is a real uh, straight shot from Smith to Marx here, which I will try to, uh, try to bring out. Uh, these people are polar opposites in certain ways, uh, but in other ways, uh, it's remarkable how much Marx got from Smith. This is a quotation that looks, I'll read this. Okay. The man whose whole life is spent in performing a few simple operations of which the effects are perhaps always the same or nearly, has no occasion to exert his understanding or to exercise his dimension in finding out expedients for removing difficulties which never occur. He naturally loses, therefore, the habit of such exertion and generally becomes as stupid and ignorant as it's possible for a human creature to, come, to become. Uh, it sounds like... Uh, Marx at his most uh, sort of vindictive and resentful. This is Adam Smith. It's actually from Adam Smith. So according to E.G. West, Smith feared that without a rigorous education, factory workers would have no idea what to fight for, what to fight against, and would become dupes of uh, themselves often equally uncomprehending revolutionaries. And so West says the root of alienation in Rousseau as well as in Marx is economic interdependence and exchange based on uh, private property. But Smith actually, it's a contrast here, to him property, wealth, and commodity production are preconditions for the non-alienated state. It's just that they aren't a guarantee of that because it's in that state that individuals have the time to pursue refinement in art. They have the money and the time. So West goes on to remark, what may appear to Marxists as pointless, interminable, a quest for marginal advances in productivity, that itself becomes an art form, a healthy expression of the creative impulse. So you, you might think, the window envelope, I've thought a way of shaving one second off a secretary's workday, or maybe 10 seconds, you think, what's the point? Well, you add it up. And the point is overwhelming. Uh, the Kendrick family, where my, uh, <coughs> endowed my professorship, uh, they invented, uh, Mr. Kendrick invented online registration. So I don't know, College of Charleston, what is it like here at registration time? But you could imagine a time before, uh, before the internet anyway, that uh, uh, when you would line up to register. It sounds like, sounds like this barbaric thing. No, you would, you, would, you would be lined up around the block to register. And maybe you'd have punch cards, uh, but you'd, like, you'd be like looking at Rolodexes and things, and you'd be writing things down. And they'd write your name down, and I'm like, I've got to make sure you're writing that down on the right form, because otherwise I'm not in the course. Okay, so, but you stand in line for hours every semester and millions of hours around the country, millions upon millions of hours of people in their most, the most productive learning stage of their lives just sitting there in line. And in Tucson, they're sitting in line like in a 100, 100 degree heat. So we would, I, I was a student, we would sit in line and there would literally be ambulances waiting in line with us <laughs> for the students who would fall over, right, in the 100 degree heat. Because they just came from Iowa or someplace like that. Uh, I mean, just amazing, or Saskatchewan, like my case. So, yeah, just little things, but they aren't little things. It's a, it's a real creativity to figure out, I can save lifetimes worth of work with this one little thing, and I will get rich in the process. So, uh, so it's, not, uh, it's not pointless or interminable. It's an art form uh, to shave that time off, uh, like Henry Ford and that sort of thing, figuring out little ways to make the assembly line more productive. So innovators experience commercial and technological breakthroughs as liberating affirmations of their exquisitely refined commitment to excellence rather than as never-ending turns and turns in some cosmic uh, rat race. So Marx anticipated, as Smith did, that alienation would not be confined to a factory floor, but would instead one day be found even among well-paid white-collar workers. So this is about you too. It's, uh, it's not, it doesn't presuppose dismal working conditions. It, 
It can happen in posh offices to executives who no longer see a connection between their labors and the possibility of satisfaction from a work well done, pride. It can happen to investors when investors come to uh, perceive their investments as nothing more than electronic gambles uh, rather than as estimable opportunities to help out a, somebody with a worthwhile idea. <clears throat> and anybody know the cartoon Dilbert? I had that cartoon Dilbert before. <coughs> <coughs> Large organizations, private, governmental, at makes some difference, but, but you still find the problem wherever you go in large organizations. Legions of Dilberts, whose main challenge every day is to cover their tracks in large bureaucracies, where the drive to deliver an excellent product, you know, everybody who's uh, like over, a, over their sort of mid-twenties is looking around, you know, you know. Uh, every day cover their tracks. <coughs> the excellent product that's not the point anymore. It's, it's a drive to secure a less vulnerable position in the office hierarchy. <clears throat> so Smith's and Mark's concerns are related, not identical, <clears throat> but it's easy to see why Smith would have inspired Marx as he did. <clears throat> <coughs> Sorry. Less obviously, there's a different kind of risk to a person's soul that goes with the fact that one of life's great pleasures is finding kindred souls. I need some more water. I think that'll come back. Paul and Counts in Tucson are <laughs> at historic levels. And, uh, Well, I'm near done. So, um, it's another, another kind of risk. We actively seek out companionship and uh, a meeting of minds. And that desire for concord <coughs> it runs really deep. Run so deep that it can corrupt us. <clears throat> we tend not to notice our tendency to adjust our attitudes to those people around us. But uh, adjusting subconsciously <coughs> makes us all the more vulnerable to social pressure. So if we noticed ourselves going along to get along, then we'd be able to be self-conscious about it and at least resist it at some level. But if we don't even notice ourselves, adjusting is needed so as to be agreeable company for our potential allies, our ability to master that threat to our autonomy is compromised. <clears throat> the abdication is motivated by self-preservation in a way, but also by a deficiency of self-love. 
<coughs> so one, just by degrees, lets oneself become a self that one can't afford to examine too closely. <coughs> a self maybe not fully worthy of esteem. So we have to take stock. We can't help but ask ourselves how we're doing. <coughs> we don't have the option of being indifferent to whether we're visible to others. If we can't be indifferent though, Smith understood better than just about anybody, any philosopher. He was extremely smart about this distinction between being esteemed <coughs> and deserving esteem. So we can be sensitive to that and preserve our psychological independence by reminding us that we aren't seeking out sympathy for our false facades. It's our real selves for which we want a sense of belonging. That need for recognition, deep visibility, leaves us open to various disappointments. <clears throat> Does that seem intuitively right to you? I don't know if it's ever happened to you, but if somebody comes up to you and says, you know, I, I really liked that uh, paper you wrote. That was a great paper, best paper I ever read on the field. And you say, really? Thank you. That, um, I said, so yeah, that, uh, yeah uh, the, the only paper I like better than that is your paper on biocentrism. And you say, what do you think my name is again? Uh, right? And it turns out you're not who they were praising. It's not the same, right? So, and if you fake being something, you know, if you pretend you're somebody else and then they think well of somebody else, it's not the same. <clears throat> so it's, it's your real self. And if you paint a false picture of yourself, you're pretty much guaranteeing yourself a loss. You're guaranteeing that it won't be the real you that gets esteemed. So um, that need for recognition, it does leave us open to various disappointments. Uh, and here's just, uh, just a few to close. Uh, when a partner, I think as a partner, appeals directly to my benevolence rather than to my self-interest, the relationship becomes a one-way street, and its failure to sustain me materially eventually translates into a failure to sustain me emotionally as well. I start to feel like a mere means, like a pawn. <clears throat> Second thing, if I start to feel like a feudal serf having no choice about whom I do business with or at what price, even if I just feel that way, if I'm not merely depending on others but I feel like I'm at their mercy, then that's another way for commerce to be alienating for me rather than affirming. And the third thing is if my way of making partners better off involves no particular alertness on my part, if I feel like a cog in the wheel, endlessly repeating a mindless task, maybe of someone else's design, then that too is a relationship that makes, fails to make me feel visible as an esteemed member of a community of estimable traders. So all of those things lead me to stop caring so much about the excellence of my craft. I can't see myself as visible, and it's a short step from there to being un is unable to see myself as estimable. And so I fail to be all that a member of market society can be, and instead I become like the kind of creature uh, on the factory floor lamented by uh, Marx and Dickens. So I'll just uh, read a bit from my conclusion here. I've got some stuff on uh, uh, Smith as a defender of uh, egoism and how, in fact, how incredibly complicated his relationship to that topic was. But the conclusion is this. Uh, Smith has a story about the wealth of nations, how wealth grows, liberating us in the process. 
but how we systematically fail to take full advantage of opportunities for the liberation that wealth creates. Smith sees commercial society emerging in his time, in the process liberating people economically from the shackles of destitution and the shackles of feudalism, he sees society potentially liberating people psychologically to opening up a door to a gusher of human possibility, which it did. And yet Smith also wonders, <coughs> who will have what it takes to stride into that limitless future? Will people, enough people, be sufficiently educated? Will the working class be a reservoir of talent from which Edison's and Mozart's will emerge? Uh, uh, will their children, the children of working class people, have the chance to lift the ceiling of human possibility? So long as people are trading freely, trading only when their partners consent, they will be led as if by an invisible hand to do right by their trading partners. But the funny thing is, they're not led as if by an invisible hand to do right by themselves. We face an abiding risk of waking someday to find out that we've been keeping up with the Joneses, that we've been shackled by crony capitalists or by men of system. We also face risks that we won't wake up and won't realize we've been shackled by social pressure. So practicing true self-love in ways newly made possible by technological and commercial progress is life's greatest challenge. And so the market throws down the gauntlet and there's no guarantee we'll be up to the challenge that it offers us. So my apologies again for my episode, and uh, thank you, and I'll stop for questions now. Uh, there's a, a lot of different dimensions to your uh, question. So there's a, there's a question about the rule of law uh, as a, um, and there's maybe some other part of the question too. But are, so are you asking about, about the provision of protection or something like that? Well, uh, I mean, let's just take it inside of the realm of thinking <coughs> Right, right. Um, yeah, well, uh, there, there's just, that is such a complicated question. But uh, <coughs> if you think about um, Smith operating in the uh, late 1700s and it's uh, Smith is worried, <coughs> uh, in effect, about there being too much law rather than there being too little at this time, or too much of a particular kind of law, too much, too much of a way of you know, making it illegal for uh, merchants to satisfy their customers' wants, basically. So, uh, so in particular, things like uh, beer, um, 
that was tightly regulated and there were only something like four people who could sell beer in London and hundreds of people who would have loved to have gotten into that game. But the people who got into, the, into it are ones who could make enough money from a monopoly license to help finance an army to continue fighting France. <coughs> uh, and so um, that's part of the background um, that he saw uh, regulation and price controls, above all price controls, as all of those free market guys that, you know, starting with Smith coming after, the thing that they really, what really terrorized them was price controls. Like free health care uh, wasn't such a big problem, uh, but price controls prevent people from signaling what they want prevent people from getting what they want systematically that's the point um, you know prevent prevent people from working at a wage that's suitable that's agreeable to them and to their prospective employer and so on but uh, law was coming into it was becoming a different kind of thing we have a it was only in the 1600s that uh, that people started writing down decisions from, from legal cases and uh, marketing them, putting together. The first case book was assembled in the 1620s, I think. And until then, if you had a, a law and the judge said, well, let's do it this way. Here's how you set. You guys are fighting over this creek. Here's how I'm going to decide this. And somebody says, well, that's not the way the other judge decided decided it, and people, no, he did just decide it that way, and they'd have an argument about it. Well, it's not written down, or it's written down in too many places. So uh, they started recording verdicts, and that became the system of precedent. Okay, so in the 1620s, <clears throat> if you ask Edward Cook, who was the guy who created the first uh, case book, and he, there are records of him, like, standing in the chambers, toe-to-toe -to -toe with King James, I think it was, spitting in each other's faces, uh, yelling at each other, and eventually Cook being put in jail at least once, maybe a couple of times. And uh, Cook saying, he was the chief justice at the time, he said, no, you don't get to, you don't get to set prices. It's not your, uh, it's only the parliament that gets to uh, set prices or grant licenses um, to guilds and things. King says, no, that's, my, that's me. Okay, so sent uh, him to jail. He came back as a, as a member of parliament and got those laws through. And if you look then at a uh, hundred odd years later, there's Smith fighting against monopoly privilege. Kind of interesting. That fight has been won so many times, still never went away. <clears throat> so there's always a tendency for the law to evolve in that direction, to uh, create new means of basically generating revenues and siphoning them off. Now, um, as far as, um, in some of these things, the kings, you know, sort of grabbed the roads, said, these are the king's roads now. You don't get to travel on these roads without paying a tariff or something like that. But, uh, but these things had the effect of uh, extending the realm of the king's peace. And that was fantastically liberating for commerce, whether the king intended that uh, or not. So you create a realm, uh, you create a framework. So you might say, could, uh, could shopping malls provide traffic lights? And you say, that doesn't really matter. What matters is to have a framework, an infrastructure in which getting to the market is as cheap as, as it can possibly be. You want to get the transaction costs down. So whether they're public roads or private, it doesn't matter. I mean, whether the parking lots are public or private doesn't matter. You want them to be as close to free as possible. You want shopping malls, you know, maybe to pay for them. But if they don't pay for them, you want a government to pay for them, maybe. But whatever, whatever it is that facilitates commerce, you want your property rights system to evolve in a system that, in a way that uh, facilitates commerce, because that's what, what it's all about at the end of the day. 
So peace is going to be essential to that. And again, these free market thinkers, Smith and all of them after that, they see the trade-off, right? They see <clears throat> we've got to have a public infrastructure. They're not doctrinaire. Uh, they say we've got to have an overarching provision above all of the rule of law, but lots of other things that go with the rule of law, like maybe traffic management, that sort of thing. And um, And it's, you know, the deliverer of that is not, so, it's not as important as the price and the efficacy of it. So, and, and the markets per se, you don't rely on them. Maybe they will provide. You don't want to get in the way if they'll provide them themselves. Uh, but, uh, but if necessary, you, you just provide them. Um, and in, uh, you know, in Canada, uh, you know, there's lots of things where I'm from. Uh, there's lots of things that you would line up. Yeah, I mean, if you wanted to see a doctor about one thing, you line up for six months, and you line up for another thing, or you ask about another thing, and it turns out they provide the best care in the world, and you don't have to wait. And it seems to me you'd say, well, whatever it is, however it is, that second kind of care is being delivered. That's the kind I want, not the first way. Um, and so if you found out, well, the first way is guaranteed, then nobody has to pay for the second way or that, that way. Nobody has to pay for that way. You'd say, well, I don't care about that. What I care about is people actually being able to get it. You know, that everyone gets it equally, that's not the point. It's getting it that's the point. So, uh, so yeah, you, there's no particular reason to uh, depend upon the market to provide things like night watchmen, say, or uh, security guards, policemen, um, most of the police, I think, in America are privately provided. Doesn't matter, uh, but you know it's just a fact. Um, so you want you want that to happen. The markets can't work if you don't have that. So you know, above all, you gotta you gotta think of the market as a place where, like, okay, I'm producing something really valuable that other people want. I've got a pile of gold or something like that. What's my concern? Well, I gotta keep it secret. People hit me on the head. Um, you want to go from there to being in a situation where I want to take the most valuable stuff I've got and I want to put it in cased in glass with neon lights saying, you want this. And I want to, I want to exaggerate the value of it. I am so keen to exaggerate the value of what I'm trying to sell that we need laws against fraud and things like that. That's the kind of, that's a, that's a revolution in, 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 the, in peace. Uh, in being able to depend on each other when you go to a situation where like you, you need laws against false advertising as much as you do against burglary. Um, so, but that's, uh, you know, that's what you want in a marketplace. That's what you want. That's how secure you want people to feel in their, in their, uh, you know, their life, liberty, and property. Go ahead, Jennifer. Yeah. Um, yeah, he, he, he very seldom mentions the invisible hand. And when he does mention it, it's, uh, it's not really what you, uh, what you think. So, uh, in the second chapter of Wealth of Nations, where he says, why is it? What is it that drives people, uh, you know, to... to uh, the market. And you think, well, what's he going to say? This is where we're going to read about the invisible hand. This is where he's going to talk about self-interest. And no, he doesn't. He says we're driven to the market by a propensity to truck, barter, and exchange. And it's only later that he starts talking about self-interest, self-love, actually. So he's thinking of that drive to be part of a community. You know, that's when you're really part of a community, when you're showing up saying, you need some of this. I got it for you. That's, you're making yourself part of a community. I brought stuff here. You know, I'm willing to make a deal for you. You can, you can do something for me too. We're going to exchange. You're going to go home glad that I showed up. 
So that's the fundamental human motivation <clears throat> to truck barter exchange, to be an important part of a community, actually. Okay, now then he says, you flip the page and he says, we address ourselves not to the benevolence of the butcher and baker, but to their self-love. Okay, now we're talking about self-love. In a way, yes, of course, but we're still not. Uh, because what he's still positing <coughs> is that what's fundamentally driving us is benevolence. Okay, and we walk into the butcher shop, or maybe the butcher walks into our bakery, and we say, oh, you got something I want. I got something you want. And I'm going to address myself to your self-love. I'm going to say, I really need that. I really need that uh, veggie burgers or whatever bur butchers sell. Yeah. Um, so uh, why are we going to address ourselves to their self-love? Is this because that's the only impulse they have? No, it's because we care about them. It's because we're benevolent. If we're benevolent, then we try and put ourselves in our customer's shoes. And we say, I, I can see it from your perspective. And I want to do something that's good for you. So I'm telling you what, I'm going to give you this product rather than that product. I'm going to sell at this price rather than that price. So to be really, <coughs> to be really good at what you do, you have to be seeing it from your customer's perspectives. And you have to be caring about their their perspectives. So in a fundamental way, this is, this is exactly what a person would say if they were looking in an economically sophisticated way from the perspective that Smith was trying to look at. It was, was trying to figure out the nature of a virtuous person and the nature of a sympathetic person. Yeah, so there's, a, there's, an, awful, there's an awful lot to that uh, invisible hand thing. <coughs> and incidentally, <coughs> Smith had a, a teacher, Francis Hutcheson, who wrote about the invisible hand. And uh, here's a funny thing. Uh, I always laugh when I think about it anyway. Maybe you have to be a professor to think this kind of thing is funny. But Francis Hutcheson is, uh, he's writing about virtue and he says, you know, all we really do want to do is benefit our community to as much as possible. But in trying to figure out wheat, my community needs wheat. I'll bring wheat, right? In trying to figure out a way to benefit my community as much as possible, I'm led as if by an invisible hand <laughs> to do things that result in, in my own family and myself being fed as well. Okay, so I'm thinking Smith has taken notes in college. Uh, maybe he's kind of sitting back there like you and he doesn't really have his pen in his hand and he's, he's thinking, yeah, yeah, I got this. Is it on the, yeah, yeah. Okay, so then it comes time for the exam. And now he's sweating. Now he's trying to figure out, where are my notes? What, what did he say again? Well, it was, it was being led as if by an invisible hand. So he started thinking, oh, man, this is how it makes sense. It's like, yeah, I'm doing good things for my customers, even though I'm just trying to make a buck. And all of a sudden, economics was born. Are there any questions? Um, yeah, so I'll sort of take a moment and thank Professor Smith for coming today. I'm sure if you have questions or whatnot, he'll be interested to hang out for a few minutes and come down and, yeah. and, and talk to him. Like I said, I'm not contagious. It's just, <laughs> it's just allergies and a sinus infection. Sorry. But thank you all for coming.